Good morning, church. Good morning, Faith Bible Church. Pastor Nick here, and uh, today we are sitting in my office. <laughs> Over the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months, we've had some uh, fun times as we've we've been scouting out different locations and stuff. And I had a location all scouted out for this morning to to deliver this message from. And um, I just got to thinking about the simplicity of the message and um, just the the impact of the message, and thought, man, we got to scale this back and get back to the basics because this is just a basic message of what it means to be a follower of Jesus. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is found in Second Kings chapter two. Second Kings chapter two is going to be our, our main passage today, and this is all about relationship. This is all about mentoring. This is all about discipleship. What it means to be a disciple. What it means to to disciple someone else. And so we're going to cover a couple different passages, but our main focus is going to be sitting here in Second Kings chapter two. And I just wanted to come and 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 bring a, a simple message this morning. So here we have it. We're going to talk about journeys today. We're going to talk about being on a journey, and if you think about a journey, maybe you've gone on a road trip, maybe you've um, gone with friends on a road trip, something like that. When you go on a road trip, uh, you, you, you travel down many different roads. Some of them are, are fast, like a highway. Some of them are slow if you're going through a town or, or you've got um, a break in your trip. Sometimes you hit a rest stop to get a little bit of a, a rest. Sometimes, man, you're just cruising through. If you've been on highways like in Kansas, man, it's you know, 70, 80 miles an hour, and it is just, you're just flying by, flying through it maybe daydreaming, you got your, your car on cruise control because it's just flat and straight and you're just going. And other times, Lord, you're in the mountains and you're, you're driving around and having to take twists and turns and things like that. And so journeys are are uh, full of different experiences. And, and uh, as we take our, our journey through life, we may be having different experiences with, with different people. Um, maybe someone comes into your life and they have a really Im a, a big impact and then, and then they leave. There are other people who come into your life and they seem to stay and stick around forever. And, and both relationships are okay. Both relationships are okay because we move through different phases of life and sometimes people come in and then they move out and other people uh, stay a little bit longer. And so we want to talk about what it means to, to be a disciple today, what it means to, to be kind of in a mentoring relationship based on the passage of 2 Kings chapter 2. Let's go ahead and, and read this passage. And I'm going to look down at my Bible and, and read this. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, I, I've had it more scripted, more fine-tuned. But today, it's just going to be simple, bare bones. And so I hope you'll, uh, you'll stick with me for this message. But 2 Kings chapter 2 says this, The time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Elijah and Elisha were traveling from Gilgal, and Elijah said to Elisha, Stay here, the Lord is sending me on to Bethel. Now, before we get started going, going a little deeper into this passage, um, if you're familiar with the Bible, if you're familiar with the Old Testament at all, you know who Elijah is. If you're not familiar with who Elijah uh, was, uh, go back to 1 Kings and, and go into then this, this uh, first couple chapters of 2 Kings and, and read about Elijah. He was a prophet from God. He was one of the main prophets of God. He followed in the footsteps of Moses. He had many miracles attributed to his name and to his work. Now, he confronted kings. Uh, he, he's the one who confronted all the false prophets on Mount Carmel uh, when uh, they, they set up those, those altars, the two altars, one to, to Baal and one to God, the God of Israel. And Elijah puts the, the prophets of Baal to a challenge and ends up wiping them all out. And, and uh, Elijah... Um, um, shows that uh, through the power of the Lord that that God uh, is the one true God of Israel. And so Elijah had some mighty things happening in his life. But at one point in time, God comes to him and says, back in actually 1 Kings chapter 19, God comes to Elijah, who's the mighty prophet from God, and says to him, I'm going to have you pick uh, I got I got a successor all picked out for you. All right, you're going to go find this guy. His name is Elisha, and we find in chapter 19 of First Kings. And if you have time to turn there, go ahead and turn there. But it says Elijah left there and found Elisha, son of Safrat, as he was plowing. Twelve teams of oxen were in front of him, and he was with the twelfth team. Elijah walked by him and threw his mantle over him. And Elijah left the ox and ran to him, follow Elijah, and said, Please let me kiss my father and mother, and then I will follow you. Uh, go on back, he replied. Elijah said, Go on back for what I have done to you, for what I have done for you. So he returned back from uh, following him, took the team of oxen, slaughtered them with the oxen's wooden yoke, 
and plow, and he cooked the meat and gave it to the people, and they ate. Then he left, followed Elijah, and served him. So here you have this man, Elijah, mighty man of God, known throughout the land, uh, many miracles, uh, standing up to kings, uh, having some problems of his own and, and some insecurities of his own. But here he picks uh, this guy, uh, Elisha, as his successor. And as, El- as Elijah asks him to follow him, uh, Elisha knows what this means. Uh, Elisha knows what it means to, to follow a prophet of the Lord, to, to be called to, to step beside this prophet and follow him. He knows that, that if he steps into this road, if he steps uh, onto this destiny that that, that he will become a prophet of the Lord. And we're going we're gonna to see that flesh out in Second Kings. And so Elisha knows what this means. Elisha dives uh, headfirst into this relationship with Elijah. So Elijah can mentor him, can disciple him, can teach him, can train him, uh, can, can do all of those things to get him ready for the work that he is going to do. All right, so uh, that's that's the basic setup of the relationship. Elisha gives it all up when he, when he burns the the yoke, when he uh, roasts the um, cattle uh, to to feed the people. He's basically burning his business to the ground. He's basically selling his business, saying, "I'm done with this." He's selling his business and taking all the proceeds, everything that he would have gotten from it, taking all the proceeds and giving it away. And then he steps out and, and follows Elijah and, and commits himself to following in the footsteps of Elijah. And so here we have Elisha following Elijah for about six years before we come to Second Kings chapter 2. So they've been uh, together for about six years and they've been, they've been sharing together in, in meals. Uh, Elijah been, has been teaching him. Elisha is experiencing the work that is, that is coming from Elijah's hands through the power of the, the Spirit. And Elisha is, is growing more and more in his understanding of what it means to be a prophet of God, what it means to walk down this road. And, and he, is, he has dedicated himself to follow the this man Elijah. All right, so there you have it. And here we have in in 2 Kings chapter 2 that it starts out with the time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven in a whirlwind. Now, this is a famous story. And we've started a summer series uh, based on your favorite stories of the Bible. And so Elijah and Elisha got a couple of votes here. And I thought I thought it was really appropriate to actually dive into the story of what it means to, to be a disciple, what it means to, to be in a, a, a mentor-mentee type relationship. Because again, we've talked about this over the last couple of weeks. Our world has changed. Our, our world has made adjustments. Our world is in a, a reboot, uh, so to speak. And as we are coming out of this, I think it's a great time for us to evaluate uh, what our relationships look like. And the the intentionality of our relationships. We've spent a lot of time apart. We've we've been told to to put some things on hold, and that means even relationships being on hold, uh, in in some sense. Now we we've been we've been close to to family, maybe even a couple friends, but a lot of our relationships have kind of been on put on hold. And I think what we're going to find as we come out of this is we're going to start to strip away the things that that no longer. Uh, have as much importance for us. They don't. They don't hold the weight uh, um, for us. Maybe. Maybe we're stripping away some of the burdens that we were carrying, trying to get back to a, a more simpler life, a more simple time. I know. Over the last few weeks, I have enjoyed, um, fully enjoyed, the 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 simplicity of life. Yeah, I, I've been working every single day, and I know there are a lot of people who've been working every single day, but but there, there, there was something about doing the work and having other things stripped away so that, that I could be home and, and enjoying time with family and things like that and focusing on what was really important. And a lot of times the relationships in our lives, the, the mentor-mentee relationships in our lives, the discipleship relationships in our lives do come from family from the family that's close to us, like a father and a son, a mother, a daughter, or a father and daughter, and, and, and whatever it may be. Um, uh, uh, but sometimes they don't. I, I, as I was thinking about this passage and putting this passage, uh, the, 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 the message together for this passage, I got to thinking about my, my own relationships that I've had in the past, specifically the ones who have mentored me in the past. And I got to thinking of um, my, my old youth pastor, Frank, and he had such an impact in my life and I spent four years in high school uh, under his leadership. And he was one of the ones who first, besides my family, but he was one of the ones who first started to, to see in me and to, to challenge me to, to move into this direction called ministry, to, to move in the direction of, of church work. 
And so when I went off to uh, school and started studying pastoral ministry, uh, Frank was behind me and his influence was behind me, pushing me forward, pushing me forward and say, you know what? He was such an influential part of my life. I want to be like him. I want to do the work that he was doing. And he was one, Frank was one who, who drove me forward. I remember being in school, and a lot of you, if, if you went to college, you may have had a professor who really, who really stuck out as, you know, this, this man or woman really helped me figure out who I am, what my giftings are. Um, they, they helped me through the college experience to, to come out on the other side, really more focused on where the Lord was leading me. And, and one of those people in my life was uh, a lady called, uh, her name was uh, Bonnie Osmond. And um, Bonnie actually, Professor Osmond, she actually passed away just, just recently, a couple months ago. And there have been a number of us on social media who, who, who were either advised by her or had classes from her that just were reflecting back on, on the influence that, that she had in our lives as, as we were um, studying and preparing to, to move out in, into the workforce and pursue the ministry that the Lord uh, w was guiding us into. And, and so people like that, I remember uh, Pastor Glenn, one of my first pastors, as, as I'm an adult, choosing a church on my own, and, and then my wife joining me uh, as we were uh, dating in college. But Pastor Glenn, I remember he gave me the opportunity straight out of school to to preach my first message. I'd preached messages in the classroom and for exercises and 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 stuff like that. But but Pastor Glenn in the church allowing me to to step up and preach as just a young kid preach that that first message and and to help confirm that oh yeah this is a calling. This is something that the Lord is, this is a path that the Lord is walking me down. And he recognized that and he allowed me to, to start to develop those, those giftings and allowed me to step up um, a couple times uh, in his tenure as, as pastor of our church. And then as we got a new pastor who, uh, who he became a, this new pastor became a real mentor in my life. And he's the one who really pushed and said, okay, now's the time. Now's the time for you to step out and to move into this thing called church work. And so we worked for years. I followed him for, for years, three or four years, weekly working with him on what it meant to, to be a minister, what it meant to be a, a full-time pastor. And, and so as I was looking at, at this relationship of Elijah and Elisha, it got me reflecting on my own relationships, uh, my, my own past relationships and how they helped move me forward. And maybe you can relate to that. Uh, maybe there are people in your lives who have really helped move you forward in life and you would call them a mentor. Maybe you would call, you would say that you are one of their disciples because you are following after them. And this is where we find these men. And we find them at, at the tail end of Elijah's journey. And in fact, the text says right off the bat, the time had come for the Lord to take Elijah up to heaven. And he's going to do it in a spectacular way. But the time had come for, for uh, the Lord to take him back to, up to heaven. And Elisha was going to be put into a position where he was going to carry on the ministry that Elijah had started. And, and Elijah, as they're traveling, he starts to put Elisha to a test. It's his last day on earth. And, and he, 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 he's got this young guy, Elisha, and he's going to put him to a test and said, Are you dedicated? Are you dedicated to this? And so he says, he says to Elijah, they were traveling to Gilgal. And Elijah said to Elisha in verse 2, Stay here. You stay put. You stay put. You stay here. The, the Lord is sending me on to Bethel. Now, three times Elijah is going to put Elisha to this test. Three times he's going to say the same thing. You stay here, okay? I, I'm going to go to to Bethel. He says in verse two. In verse three, he says, "Hey, I'm going to go to." Uh, excuse me. In um, verse four, he says, "I'm going to go to Jericho. Stay here. Stay put." All right, we, we moved on to Bethel. You stay here. I'm going to Jericho, all right? And, and then he says, hey, okay, now, now I'm going on to the Jordan. You stay here. You stay put. And, and all three times, Elisha comes back, says, no, 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 no. As the Lord lives, as you yourself live, as you are still here, I will never, I will not leave you. I am dedicated to this work that we are doing. I am dedicated to the mission that, that God has, has, has brought to us. I am dedicated to the task. I will not be swayed. And, and it's important as we look at what it means to, to be in a mentor relationship, if you find yourself as, as a mentee, to be dedicated to the task that the Lord has put in front of you. Sometimes we want to jump ahead. Sometimes we, we want to 
to start to carry the burden ourselves and, and move in our own direction. El Elisha here calls us back and says, no, this is what it means to follow. This is what it means to follow. And in fact, in First Kings, when we, we find that Elijah is calling Elisha to follow him, it says in the last verse of 1 Kings chapter 19, Then he left. Elisha left, and he followed Elijah, and he served him. He knew what his position was. He knew what his place was. He knew his place was a place of learning, a, pl a place of following, a, a place of, of, of seeing what Elijah was going to do and then being able to, to follow that, learn from that, uh, learn from those teachable moments and, and follow in his footsteps. And even at the end here, when he knows, okay, this is happening. I'm about to step out. I'm going to be put in the position of, of leadership now. He says, no, no, no. I am still dedicated to following you till the end. I'm still dedicated to the task at hand. And it's important as we look at the relationships to, to realize, yeah, yeah, we need to be dedicated. We need, we need to have our focus on the work that the Lord has set before us at that time. And Elisha says, I am dedicated to the task that, that, you, uh, that you are giving me, that you are working with me. Now, as we walk through life, there are going to be so many distractions, right? There are going to be so many things of this world, uh, of our own flesh, uh, of the, the enemy who wants to, to tear, about the work, tear apart the work that the Lord is doing. There are going to be so many things in this world that are going to try to tear us away from our mission. And, and this it, it was no exception. Eli Elisha was no exception in that. In fact, we see here in these verses, in verse 3, it says, Then the sons of the prophets who were at Bethel came out to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? We find in verse 5, uh, Then the sons of the prophets who were in Jericho came to Elisha and said, Do you know that the Lord will take your master away from you today? Do you know? Do you realize what's happening? Do you realize what's happening? Do you see what's what's going on around you? Do we, we need to point something out to you. Don't you realize that your master is going to be taken up? And they, they came in as a distraction for Elisha. And may, maybe they didn't mean to. Maybe they didn't mean to. Maybe they thought they were filling him in on something, but it was a distraction. And Elisha's response to them is, yes, I know. Be quiet. Don't try to put this other stuff in front of me. Don't try to, to, to surround me just with grief and loss. There is a task to do. There's a task at hand. I am following in the steps of my master. I am following in the steps of the Lord. Do not bring in the distraction. But there will be things of this world that come in and they want to distract us. Now, Elijah was the prophet. Elisha was going to be the, the soon-to-be prophet. And the sons of prophets who were, who were bringing distraction to them, uh, they were a group of uh, men probably that, that, that um, they weren't prophets themselves more than likely, but they were a, kind of a radical little community that would, that would isolate themselves and just they, they dedicated themselves to the, the teaching of the prophets. So they, they thought they had the end. They thought they had the inside scoop. And they were bringing this to Elisha and and what it was was a distraction to his work because he could have he could have said either to Elijah when Elijah says stay here he could have said yeah I think I'm going to rest now I think I need to get ready I'm going to sit in the corner get get ready for my time in the ring and then I'm going to bust out all right that that could have been a, a stopping point for him a, a a halt in the mission for him and then these prophets come out and say no you know what's happening do you see what's happening around you do you, do you do you realize the loss that you're going to experience here he says yes I know. Okay, now be quiet. That's not what I'm focused on right now. I'm focused on the task at hand. I'm focused on walking with my master, my mentor, my friend, the guy who's become my father over all of the, the last six years as we've walked together. And he says, I, I know, be quiet. Let's, I want to push the distraction aside because I'm focused at the, t the, the task at hand. And so after, after all of that, after all of that, um, they find themselves at the Jordan because Elijah had told him, hey, I'm going to the Jordan. You stay here. And he says, no, I'm going with you. And so they find themselves at the Jordan. And verse 7 says, 50 men from the sons of the prophets came and stood, observing them at a distance while the two of them stood by the Jordan. Elijah took his mantle, rolled it up, struck the water, which parted to the right and the left. Then the two of them crossed over on dry ground. This is where Elijah, he, he is called... Uh, he's the same vein of prophet as Moses, and he does the same kind of work as Moses here, and that's why he was one of the big name prophets in the for for the Jewish people. And here we have him, just like Moses, parting the waters, and and the two of them walking across. And Elijah asks him a question, and I think this is a good question for for those who are in a, a mentor position. 
uh, he, he asked Elisha, tell me what I can do for you before I am taken away. What do you need from me? What do you really need from me? Is there anything I can impart to you that would help you along in this journey, all right? I've taught you, I've trained you, I've let you follow me, I've, I've let you experience the work that uh, of my hands and let you experience my life. And, and I know you're going to be picking up this mantle. I know you're going to be taking on the job. What can I give to you? Is there anything that I can offer you to help you along on your journey? What do you need? And so Elisha answered, please let me inherit two shares of your spirit. Now this looks like a big ask. Uh, uh, for on the surface level, we read, read this. I think as, as an American church, as we read this, we think, man, whoa, he's really trying to climb the ladder there. He's really trying to get ahead. He's really trying to get more prestige, more honor. Uh, he's trying to be more successful than, than even Elijah is with this request. Let me inherit two shares of your spirit. I want double of what you had. I want double double of what you've experienced. I want, I want double the honor uh, of this work, in this work, as I walk and, and do this, this work through the Spirit. I want double. But what he's really asking here is, you know what? You've been my father. You've been my, my spiritual father all of these years, and I walk beside you. I've been faithful to this relationship. Uh, I, I've learned from you. I, I've struggled with you. I've seen your strengths. I've seen your weaknesses. Uh, you have become a father to me. And what I would like to ask for is the, the double share of the inheritance. Now, this during this time, this was a, a common thing. It, it, if a father had sons, the oldest son would get a double portion of the inheritance when the father died. And so Elisha is coming to him and saying, hey, you know what? I'm like your son. I want to have a, a double portion of the inheritance. When, 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 when the spirit moves, when, when you're gone and the spirit moves, I want to have a large part uh, of, of that spirit, of, of, of your giftings, uh, of your ability. As a, as a father would pass on the resources to a son, the oldest son, I want you to pass on those resources to me. And Elijah replies, you have asked for something difficult. If you see me be being taken away, you will have it. If not, you won't. Because Elijah has to remind him, you know what? All these gifts come from the Lord. All these gifts come from the Lord. Ultimately, everything that we need, everything that we need to be equipped to do the work comes from the Lord. All right, And the gifts that you will be given, the, the, the opportunities that you will be provided, the, the miracles that you will do, the, the teaching, the correcting, whatever you are going to do, as you're walking through the Spirit, the Spirit is going to be the one who is going to guide you and, and give you the gifts and equip you for the work of the ministry that you are about to do. And as they continued walking, verse 11, and they were talking, a chariot of fire with horses of fire suddenly appeared and separated the two of them. Then Elijah went up into heaven in the whirlwind. As Elijah watched, uh, Elisha watched, he kept crying out, my father, my father, see there it is, there it is. This is my relationship that, to you as, as father and son. My father, my father, the chariots and the horsemen of Israel. The, the horsemen and, and chariots of Israel were a symbol of protection for the nation uh when, when it talks to the, the the lord of armies and and um and the, the chariots and the horsemen of, of Israel, uh, he's seeing the, the protection of Israel. He's seeing the, the, the one who protects Israel come and, and take his mentor and, and take him up to heaven. And, and Elijah wasn't taken away by the chariots and horsemen. He was actually taken up in a whirlwind into heaven. And, and Elisha sees this. Elisha sees this. And when he could see him no longer, he took hold of his own clothes and he tore them in two. See, he did grieve. Elisha did grieve. He, he knew what he was losing. He knew the relationship that was, that was closing down for him. But he also knew that he had to continue walking ahead. He also knew that he had to continue moving forward. It's like the disciples, you know, the disciples who followed Jesus during Jesus' ministry. You know, they were, they were, they were grieved. They were, they were at, at loss when, when Jesus died. And then when he went to heaven, and what are we going to do? What are we going to do? How do we carry on? But you know what? Jesus had promised them. I'm going to send the spirit to you. He's going to gift you. He's going to equip you. He's going to give you everything you need to continue moving forward. Because the, the work of a disciple isn't just to, to come and learn and, and follow someone. And then, and then you sit on the sideline when it's all over. And nothing comes of it. No, the work of the disciple is to follow in the footsteps of the teacher. 
the work of the disciples to follow in the footsteps of the teacher, of the one that you've been following. And Elisha says he knows he's going to take those steps forward, but he knows he, he knows there's loss. He takes time to grieve. He takes time to, to, to bring closure to that relationship before he moves on. And he picked up, in verse 13, he picked up the mantle that had fallen off Elijah and went back and stood on the bank of the Jordan. Now, earlier on in, in 1 Kings, when, when Elijah goes and finds Elisha, the first thing that Elijah does is he puts on his coat on Elisha. He takes his coat and puts it on Elisha, symbolizing, hey, you follow me in this work. Follow me in my life. Follow me in the things that 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 that, that the Lord is doing. You come, come beside me, walk beside me, and we will be um, mentor and mentee. And, and that was an important symbolic gesture. But the mantle did not belong to Elisha yet. Elijah put it back on. He carried the mantle. He carried his own coat. But in verse 13 of, of chapter 2 of 2 Kings, we find that Elisha picks up the mantle that had fallen off Elijah. And he went back and, and stood on the bank of the Jordan. He took the mantle Elijah had dropped and he struck the water. Where is the Lord God of, uh, of Elijah? He asked. He struck the water himself, and it parted to the right and the left, and Elisha crossed over. Elisha was able to experience the same kind of work and miracle to confirm, and the scriptures record that too, to confirm that Elijah was going to walk in the footsteps of Elijah. Elisha was now the prophet of the Lord. Elisha was going to be the one who was going to carry on the work of the Lord. And when the sons of the prophets from Jericho who were observing saw him, they, they were back. Remember, they were back at the Jordan. They saw all this. They were observing all this. They said, the spirit of Elijah rests on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed down to the on the ground in front of him. Then, this is interesting, they have a request. They have a request here. The sons of the prophets said to Elisha, since there are 50 strong men here with your servants, please let them go and search for your master. Maybe the Spirit of the Lord had carried him away and put him on one of the mountains or onto one of the valleys. And the, 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 it doesn't spell out why they were asking this. There, there are a couple different reasons why. Uh, they could have been concerned that Elijah's dead body was being left on a hillside and, and a, a prophet, an esteemed prophet. How, how, how wrong was that to, to leave this esteemed prophet's corpse on the hillside instead of giving him the proper burial that he deserved? Uh, or they, they could have... They could have been looking for Elijah. Elijah was, was known to have disappeared in the past. There, there were a number of occasions where uh, he was giving a word and then, then he was gone. He, he, was, he was out in the wilderness. He, he was moving on to another task. And so Elijah was known to be here and then there. And they said, you know what? We, we want to go find him. That the work of Elijah was so important, so critical, and, and we got so much out of it. We had, we had followed his teaching for years. So, right? Remember, these, these were a group of guys who were dedicating themselves to the prophet's teaching. We have followed him for, for years, and we want to we go find him because that, that old work is what we want to hang on to. And, and Elijah says, Elisha says, no, don't send them. There's no, there's no use sending him. He, he's gone. The Lord has taken him away. But they, they argued with him and they urged him to the point of embarrassment so that he said, send them. Fine. If you need to go search out that old work, if you need to go search out that old way of doing things, fine. You know, I can't stand in your way. And so they sent 50 men who looked for three days, but they did not find him. When they returned to him in Jericho, to Elisha, where he was staying, he said to them, didn't I tell you not to go? The Lord had closed down that chapter. The, the Lord was making a change. The Lord was moving in a new way through the, through the prophet uh, Elisha. And so if these men were going to the mountain to try to seek out the old work, the old way, they were missing what the Lord was doing. They, they were missing the next step, the, the next phase, the, the next part of the journey that the Lord was taking them on. They were going to have a, a new man who they were, they were going to be able to, to come and learn from and, and see miracles and, and have this man help guide their nation. But like many of us, that we get caught up in the old, the, the comfortable. You know, I think about my own experiences. You know what? The, the mentors that I've had in the past, all of us, we, we all live at different parts of the country now. Um, the mentors who, who helped shape my life when I was younger, that we're all scattered. And sometimes I think 
man, it would be great to go back and sit under the, the feet of so-and-so, or man, to be back in class, or to be sitting in the office of, of this professor and getting wisdom and, and guidance. Man, how great would that be? But we have to realize that, no, the, the Lord is moving us along on this journey. Discipleship is about a journey. Discipleship is about movement. Christ, when, when he came, he, he was all about movement and, and moving forward. And, and he knew, even, even Jesus knew that, hey, my work is going to be complete, but you guys are going to carry it on. You guys are going to move forward. You guys are going to press on. And it's going to be a continuation of what the Lord is doing, but it's going to look totally new because not, it's not just going to be me who are, who's doing the miracles, who, who's doing the teaching, who's doing the work. It's going to be you filled with the Holy Spirit, filled with the Holy Spirit, equipped by the Holy Spirit to take on and move down that, that road, to, to, to move down that new path. And that's what discipleship is. It's, it's, it's relationship after relationship after relationship, all connected because it's the Lord who's guiding us through, the Lord who's working us through and connecting these relationships. And so a, a, a mentor has a mentee, a, a disciple, and the disciple then matures and grows and then is able to, to mentor and mature and help another grow. And that is the path of discipleship. That is the work of the church, of discipleship, discipling those who are coming after us. And the work of the work of discipleship is 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 following someone who helps you grow and then also leading someone who's a little a, a little farther uh, back than you are. A, a, a little newer to the the journey. That's what discipleship is. It's 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 following someone who has gone before and learning from them and gaining experience and gaining wisdom as well as taking someone under your wing. Who, who needs to help who needs to be helped to grow and mature and, and and move on in their journey and what the Lord wants for them that is the work of discipleship that is the work of the church and here we have this example of Elijah walking for six years with Elijah preparing him preparing him and the day comes when he passes that baton off to Elisha and says now it's your turn now it's your turn and Elisha he goes through his process process of grief he he he, he he puts closure to the relationship, and then he moves on. And he says, no, we can't be looking to the old work, the old way. Now, we will, I'm sure, you know, he was carrying on the lessons that Elijah had talked to him. He was not forsaking all of that. That's not what I'm talking about here. But he was moving on in the new way that the Lord was going to work. And he says, hey, guys, come along with me. You guys want to follow this? Come along with me. Why look for Elijah? God has taken him up in glory. God has given him his reward. God has closed down that chapter, and now we're moving into a new thing. And so all of us here at the church, if you, if, if you are part of a church, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you have been gifted. All right. Hopefully you felt like someone has come beside you and helped to, to mentor and shape your life. And hopefully, hopefully we're looking towards the future saying, who am I going to take under my wing? Who am I going to take responsibility for to help mature and grow in their faith so that they are ready to go out and, and mentor and, and do the work of the Lord? We've all been gifted. It's not a matter of not having the gifts and tools. We've, we've all been gifted by the, by the Spirit. In fact, the Apostle Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 in one of the passages there's a number of passages in here in, in Corinthians and Ephesians and a couple other uh, a couple other letters that, that Paul writes and he says that now there are different gifts but the same spirit there are different ministries but the same Lord and there are different activities but the same God produces each gift in each person you are gifted church you have a gift you have a role you have a task you have something that the lord has given to you to allow you to move on and do mighty things in his name and each of those things is going to look differently uh, the, the the letters of paul spell out the various gifts of the church the various ministries of the church but but the point of the church is they are there to build one another up those giftings are to build one another up as the body of Christ and not just build one another up, but influence and impact the world outside of these walls. That is our job. That is our job, folks. And so I think as we come out of this COVID-19 thing, I think as we see things stripped away, I think as we see relationships change, I think as we see activities change, I think one of the next great works of the church 
uh, is, is maybe to look deeper at what it means to be a disciple of Christ, what it means to, to follow Christ, and what it means to, 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 to look toward mentor and mentee relationships. I think we're going to find that as we strip away and, and let, a thing, let some things fall to the, to the side, we're, we, we, we know relationships are valuable. But I think that one of the next phases of the church as we're coming out of COVID-19 is to, to really dive into what it means to be a follower of Jesus, what it means to, to invite someone into, into our journey and help someone move along in their journey. I think that is one of the next great tasks of the church. And I think as we come out of this, uh, we're going to be trying to provide more and more opportunities to connect people, not to large gatherings. We're going to have those, but not exclusively to large gatherings, not calling us to, hey, come on in one day a week. Let's teach, let's sing, let's do some stuff like that. And then we're great. And then we go out. No, no. The, the, The point of discipleship is daily walk. It's being involved, being a part of someone's life. And I think that's going to be one of the next big things that's going to come out of this for the body of Christ is is seeing the value of those intimate, dear relationships where we're building one another up for the work of the body. It's going to come more in one-on-one experiences, I believe. May we be a people that, that seek out the next generation. May we be a people that, that seek out and, and, and have eyes to see those relationships around us that, that God has, the relationships that God has brought right before us. May we be a people who sees and sees value and, you know, I need to connect with them. I need to connect with them. There's something about how the Lord is, is, is working in their life and I, I want to be a part of that. I want to have some influence on that. I want to, to help um, impart wisdom and knowledge into that next generation, knowing knowing that they are going to be launched and they are going to do a new work. They are going to do a new thing for the Lord. Not holding on just to the old, but they're going to do a new thing. May we be a people who are mindful of that, who are fully invested in the process of of discipleship. That was Jesus' model. That was Jesus' model. May we follow Jesus' model of true and, 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 and pure, intimate discipleship bringing up the next generation, bringing up those who are around us, recognizing that we need to be heavily involved in people's lives in order for this this work to go forward, this work to move forward. That's our challenge, church. That's our challenge to, to, to dive into this thing called discipleship, to dive into this thing called relationship, and to, to go deep and, and define those connection points that the Lord has brought into our lives so that the next generation, the next phase, the, the, the next part of the journey uh, continues to move forward. Will you take that up? Will that be our challenge? Will you, will you take up the challenge? Will you move forward in that? Uh, it's, it's an exciting thing. It's also a daunting thing. I think that's why Christ tells us, hey, count the cost. Count the cost because being a follower of Jesus costs something. It's easy to say you're a Christian. It's easy to say a prayer. It's easier to feel pressure to say a prayer because you know you, you, you're, you're having a hard time or, or, or something doesn't feel right or you're, you're unsure about the future. It's easy to say a prayer. It, it's a lot harder to actually be a follower of Jesus. And Jesus is calling followers, follow me, follow me, follow me. And what did Jesus do? Jesus discipled. Jesus discipled, Jesus mentored and trained and modeled for the next generation to, in order to send them out, in order so that they could do new and, and greater works in his name. Lord, may we be a, a people that, that um, follows in your footsteps. Lord, give us the wisdom and, and guidance on how to do that. Give us the, the opportunity to, to do that. Lord, we pray that uh, as believers in you, as followers of you, though, that you would be bringing in relationships that, that would be um, critical, that we would see as critical as, as moving your, your kingdom forward, as getting the gospel message out there in powerful new ways. Lord, we, but we have to rely on you. Uh, the gifts that come uh, from you only come from the Spirit. The gifts that we need to, to do kingdom work only come from the Spirit. And so we need to, um, first and foremost, dedicate ourselves to you. Uh, we need to submit ourselves to the Spirit uh, so that we can walk in those works and those gifts. And so we come, Lord, asking for your wisdom and your grace in order to do this work. And we come in, in your name, Jesus. Amen. We just want to thank you.